These are the two gentlemen we're going to have with us today. Actually, let me go ahead and introduce them right now. Uh, so Dr. Theodore Kripner, I don't think I said that quite right. You can straighten me out later. Is professor of, <clears throat> was professor, professor emeritus, Department of Philosophy, Slippery Rock University in Pennsylvania, in case you didn't know. He was there from 1969 through 2003, taught courses in logic, philosophy of science, oriental philosophy, philosophy of religion, world religions, mysticism, and psychical research. Uh, he's been a student of A Course in Miracles since 1982. His book, Love and A Course in Miracles, can be found on Amazon, five-star review. And Mike Ravage Sewell. Yes. Sewell is a emeritus professor of philosophy uh, of peace and justice at Berea College in Kentucky, where he taught for 40 years. His eight books include The Magic Glass of Critical Thinking, The Emperor's God, and A Kinder and Gentler Tyrant. I'd like to hear about that, Mike. And his uh, blog is listed on yes. screen. I also taught for 40 years. I'm not a professor emeritus because I was never a full professor. Uh, always adjunct, uh, but from uh, 1967 through 2008. Uh, I want you to know that 100% of the receipts from what comes in today is going to provide for UNICEF relief for the refugee program. We've done this with our last two uh, sessions as well, and uh, we have over $3,000 now contributed to refugee relief. Glad that we can do it, and I really appreciate your, your helping with that. If you didn't get a chance to do that, you can go to our website, uh, again, Miracles Magazine, and indicate that that's what you would like for your contribution to be for. There's two things we want to talk about today. One of the first things that we want to talk a little bit about is, and then Ted raised this question with me uh, some months ago. Uh, the question is, why isn't academia uh, paying more attention and interested in A Course in Miracles. A Course in Miracles was given, we should remember, to two professors at Columbia University in New York City, one of the prestigious mm -hmm. Ivy League universities, one of the oldest, the oldest university in New York, in New York, actually. And um, it's no accident that that happened uh, because one of the things that the, the course does is very, very deep, if you have been a regular ongoing student, in terms of helping us to understand the basic nature of this thing that we call the ego and how it got formed and came into being and how it is that we have to work on undoing the knots that it got caught up in our system to help us to be able to see better, to see well, to see 100%, really, again, to be able to see uh, as Christ did, and that's uh, that's our challenge. But it's very interesting that it came there because, first of all, they understood that. I mean, they understood depth psychology. Bill, in particular, was writing and studying about the ego and how it did come into existence, etc. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, it's been forty-five years now since the course was published, forty-six sigma, and uh, I think it's very interesting that. Uh, it hasn't been picked up much. Now we do have, I hope, online with us today, a couple other professors. Uh, we'll meet them during the break. I think that Dr. Mark Rye is uh, with us. He's professor of psychology at Skidmore College. And I believe that Sam Minahan is on with us. And Sam is a psychologist, it's also in New York. He's the only person I know who's been able to include a discussion of the course, but it's part of a course. It's not a course on the Course of Miracles. Different psychological approaches to things. Uh, and I think he's at Fordham University. So hopefully uh, they'll come on and be able to share something a little bit later with us. So um, the first place, I, let's, let's begin. We'll spend, we're only going to take about, let's say, 15 minutes or so to talk about this question about why isn't academia paying more attention here and what your thoughts are on that. And then we'll switch over to talking about social justice for the rest of our time. Uh, Ted, would you like to kick us off because you've been thinking about this a, a lot for a little bit. Uh, thanks. Uh, and 
thanks for organizing this whole thing. It's uh, sure. a real service. And thanks to everybody for participating. It's, uh, it, it's good to share ideas and questions, I think, that help uh, illuminate the issues and perhaps bring us to insights that will uh, solve some of the problems that we're facing, I think. I personally came upon the course originally in 1975, uh, and I was very skeptical about it. Uh, I was at that time kind of like Helen in, a, in an agnostic stage of my own philosophical development. And uh, I had come out of a Catholic upbringing, which uh, I... I, I experienced some delusions or some disillusionment <laughs> with, with with the teachings that I had found I'd been raised with. And uh, of course, when you start reading philosophy, you discover so many uh, problems with the claims that there is a God that makes a universe in which evil can possibly be. And uh, when I started reading the, finally started reading the course, it, it was like, the course, I didn't come upon the course, the course came upon me. <laughs> it was like it came upon me with an insistence somehow. And I, I kept putting it off, putting it off for, for five or six years. Uh, and uh, I think what I went through is probably reflected in academia as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, new agey material tends to be a matter of suspicion. It's pop stuff. Uh, it's not uh, uh, acceptable. It's a kind of thing that comes and goes and uh, so, sort of like uh, the wind blowing through the trees. And it generally people in academics want to have something more solid than that. But when I can just say that myself, when I finally got down to reading the course carefully, I was, I confronted two things. One were the profound insights and it was, I'd been studying Buddhism and Hinduism and philosophy of science for years. And what I found with the course was something, it just grabbed me and said, uh, you've got to listen to this. And, and it wasn't insistent. It was inviting more than, than forcing itself on me. Uh, but when I started reading it, I came across what seemed to be contradictions, things, you know, like it says, for example, there is, God creates only one sun. That's in one place. And then in another place, it says God has many sons and we're all sons. So how do you get that together? I, I'm a logician primarily, I, I think logically. And when I hear there's only one son and yet there are many sons, that's a contradiction, uh, and at least as I understand that. Uh, and so anyway, I think what I found by, by applying my academic uh, skills to understanding, to, to digging into the course, I began to discover that many of those apparent contradictions uh, actually were more like Zen koans uh, that opened up to once you once you grasp the, the 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 heart of the apparent contradiction, you began to see there was another insight that was disclosed, and I found that again and again and again. Uh, unfortunately, most people in academia that I've tried, I've, I've actually given a talk on the course uh, at our university a few years ago, uh, and most of my colleagues kind of poo poo the idea. Uh, as uh, it's not, you can't take it seriously. I quite frankly think that the course is the most important document writing, perhaps since writing began. Okay, that, that's a big statement. <laughs> I agree totally. <laughs> I, I, I place it on the same level as the Vedas, the Buddhist uh, uh, sutras, uh, the gospels, uh, and uh, what I think is of value 
in bringing it to academia would, if, if it could get into the academic circle, there is two things. One, the kinds of uh, puzzles that I come across philosophically, logically in the course, I think can be resolved with good discourse, good exchange. And that's the way academics works. You present a, a view and then you get a counter view. And then as you work together on those two opposing views, then you come to a resolution. It's sort of like a synthesis out of the thesis and the antithesis. That's sort of a Hegelian idea. Right. Uh, but at this point, uh, and I, I've not seen any serious, well I, well, I mean, you do have one exception, I think it was Ken Wapnick's book, Love Does Not Condemn, which he wrote a lot of popular books, explanations, uh, but that one book is the most rigorous, academically speaking, book that I've come across about the course. Uh, I tried to put together the book uh, on the nature of love. That was the first book I tried to go, tried to explore, first concept I tried to explore on the course. And uh, it was revealing for me uh, as to what is the nature of love, which is the key concept, the key idea in the course. And if you don't understand that, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of things are fuzzy. Uh, I think the last point that is important is that the course uh, I see as a social phenomenon, hmm. uh, and it, which brings into our discussion, we'll go into that later, but I think it has extreme relevance for helping solve the problems that we're facing today. And if to the extent that more people look at it closely and seriously, and particularly academicians. I, I don't want to put academicians, I, I think there are many good people, students sure, of sure. the course, who have profound insights, maybe understand it better than I do, because it's not so much in the, you know, in the mental understanding that is important, right. but it's in the practice. You, right. have to, you have to put it into practice. You have to be able right. to give miracles uh, if you don't give miracles, you just haven't learned the course. <laughs> okay. right. uh, so that that seems to me that if society, particularly the educational institutions of the country, would open themselves up to the course, to at least discussing it, there would be a a great uh, extension of understanding and insight coming from it. Right. So, Thanks, Ted. I agree with you 100%. Uh, I think it's the most important document ever to cross the face of planet Earth, to put it very simply. And having also, like you, uh, dwelt into many of the scriptures from the past, uh, there's just nothing like it. It's a document for the 20th and the 21st century. It's a good part because it goes into this incredible depth of psychologically understanding what's going on with this mind and how we got into this mess. And, Therefore, maybe how we can get out of the mess as well. I think it's, it's interesting that you said that uh, it found you. <laughs> you know, the, I hear that time after time again. The course finds us. We don't find it. Or even we'll get it. People will say, I, I, I bought it 10 years ago. It was sitting there on the shelf. And, and I, I just couldn't get around to it. And then I picked it up and read a paragraph. And, oh, my God. <laughs> Let's go to Mike. When you tell us how, how you came to the course and, and what your perspective on this topic is, Mike. Yes. Uh, like Ted, and probably several people here, I come from the Roman Catholic tradition. As a matter of fact, uh, I was a priest for uh, a number of years, a member of the Society of St. Columban, founded in Ireland in 1918 hmm. for... Uh, bringing the good news to people in China. And that's the way I was formed. Wow. In that context, I was uh, in my training for the priesthood. I was a pretty good student. So they sent me to Rome after I was ordained to get a doctoral degree, which I did at the Academia Alfonsiana there. Over the years of teaching, 40 years at Berea College, I became a generalist. But my 
interest remains in theology and my focus remains theology. As a matter of fact, a certain kind of theology that's intimately associated with social justice. And the reference I'm making here is to liberation theology. My elevator speech on liberation theology is a one sentence definition. It's reflection on the following of Christ hmm. from the point of view of the poor and the oppressed who are intent on improving their situation economically, politically, personally, and spiritually. That's been my focus. And as a theologian, my orientation towards God was shaped, of course, a Christian theologian by biblical texts and especially by modern biblical scholarship, which forces people who are involved in that to ask questions about various books in the Bible and reminding ourselves that the Bible is not a single book, but a library of books, to look at those various inclusions in the Bible from the point of view of modern science, mm. which would have us ask questions about each and every text about who is the author? What social situation is that author coming from? Mm -hmm. What language is used? What does the language tell us about the audience? What literary form do we have here? Is it myth? Is it legend? Is it debate? Is it fiction? Is it a letter? Or is it, in the case of A Course in Miracles, <laughs> channeled discourse? Right. So if you apply those kind of criteria to the, A Course in Miracles, you find out that, okay, this was written by academicians in the United States in highly abstract language that indicates that origin and also indicates what the audience might be. The audience are highly literate people. It's written in the language of academia and in this channel discourse. Its literary form as channel discourse comes from an historical situation or an historical tradition that we might call new age spirituality. Okay. What does all that then mean in terms of our reading, A Course in Miracles? To whom is it addressed? From the, applying those criteria, I would draw the conclusion it's addressed to North American, highly educated people living in the belly of the imperial beast that Bell Hook says is white supremacist, capitalist, imperialist, patriarchy. Wow. Given that, what is the relationship of A Course in Miracles to Jesus? Ken Wapnick, the foremost exponent of A Course in Miracles, tells us, oh, it has nothing to do with the historical Jesus and even less to do with the biblical Jesus. It has to do with the Christ. And the Christ is not known from the Bible, but the Christ is known from introspection. Right. But I would say, if that's the case, why don't we call the voice in A Course in Miracles Fred or George <laughs> or Ken or Ken? Huh? Why call it Jesus? It seems to me as a, a respecter of A Course in Miracles, as a student of A Course in Miracles, that realizing that the voice of Jesus is the voice of Jesus tells us something about who the Christ is, because if Jesus is the Christ, the Christ is also Jesus. What does that mean? It tells us if the Christ is Jesus, looking at the historical Jesus and looking at the Jesus found in the gospels tells us the content of the term Christ. And Jesus himself, or in the words attributed to him in the fourth chapter of Luke's gospel, where Jesus' program is presented, says that his program is the following. He quotes the prophet Isaiah. 
I have come to bring good news to the poor. Oh, it's addressed to the poor. Jesus was addressed to the poor. Liberty to captives, freedom for the oppressed, sight to the blind, and I've come to proclaim the year of the Lord, which means debt forgiveness. You can understand how Jesus' poor audience, who unlike the audience of A Course in Miracles, was illiterate, knew nothing about philosophy, could not possibly understand A Course in Miracles, how that excited them because they were under the heel, the boot, the jackboot of the Roman Empire. So the words, freedom for the oppressed, had social justice connotations in Jesus' context. Given that kind of understanding or those questions that have formed my approach to A Course in Miracles, I have decided to read it from the point of view of the poor and the oppressed. Hmm. And that gives a social justice perspective. All right. Thanks, Mike. Now, one of the things I think we're, we talk about it being uh, intellectual, uh, but this is not entirely true insofar as any number of people have picked up the course and begin to read it. And it, it's amazing, they'll just get it. I mean, they just get it right away. I mean, they just, it's like, this is speaking to my heart and, and to the whole of my being. They may not understand the depth of complexity of it, but they, they know it's true. You know, it, it, I just know this is true. And so I hang in there. And, I, and especially one of the great benefits of the course is that we have this workbook. And if you do that workbook I and mean, you take that seriously, I mean, you, you do it with consistency and regularly, it, 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 all the more depth that, that you begin to find that it is speaking to you. So, and it's, there's no big words in the course. The biggest word is atonement. <laughs> I mean, kind of in terms of, but once we understand what the atonement is, well, it's it's really very similar. It's just the undoing of the ego. Well, that's that, that's really beautiful. Well, let's let's move now. We did we, let's over to talk more about social justice and the uh, and and the course. Uh, let's talk about what do you mean? What do we mean by social social justice? Like maybe you could start us, and then Ted, you want to pick up on that topic? Okay. Well, for me. Social justice refers to the condition where the rights that belong to people, specifically in terms of being human beings, are observed and fulfilled. Social justice is the condition where human beings get what they need and deserve as human beings. Those rights are enshrined in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, think about it, authored largely by Eleanor Roosevelt. Hmm. But those rights are the right to food, include the rights to food, shelter, clothing, health care, education, and justly remunerated work, work that gets a good wage. Hmm. Those are social rights that yield social justice. The UN Declaration also includes civil rights. And civil rights are very familiar to us in the United States because those are the ones we observe right. or try to observe or say we observe. Struggle and, they, with. and they are the right to free speech, freedom of religion, freedom to assemble, freedom to have contracts made and observed. Interestingly enough, even though the UN Declaration of Human right, Rights finds its authorship with a president's wife, <laughs> the U United States has never ratified the protocols oh, really? that implement the UN Declaration of Human Rights. We affirm that, oh, rights to freedom, to rights to freedom of speech, religion, uh, assembly are are to our real human rights, but the others, we in the United States, virtually alone in the world, say the other rights to food, shelter, clothing, healthcare, education, uh, are only human aspirations. I've tried, and I'll end here, I, I won't go on, but I've also asked my students, 
when we deal with these kind of questions in the context of teaching liberation theology. I ask them without any kind of introduction, what is a human right? Eventually we get to, okay, what belongs to people in virtue of being human? You don't have to do anything to deserve them. You're a human being, these are, never once have they begun and said the most important human right is the right to have contracts observed. Hmm. Or much, even freedom of speech, maybe sometimes freedom of religion, but usually it's, well, food. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, basic. Food, drink, uh, yeah. shelter. Uh, they do that. And I always say, well, gee, sounds like you're a bunch of socialists. <laughs> because those are the rights that socialism, the human rights, that socialism prioritizes. The human rights that capitalism prioritizes are the ones that I nominated as civil rights. That's mm. very interesting. But yeah. anyway, bottom line here, social justice refers to the human condition where what belongs to humans in virtue of being human beings is given and observed and fulfilled. Thanks, Mike. Um... Ted, you want to bounce off of uh, what Mike was just saying and take that into consideration? And also, I think, you know, how does the, how can the course help us to implement these principles? Ted, you want to take okay. it for a while? Well, I think there is, I, I, as I was thinking about this, I think one needs to keep in mind that there are two ways that the course can be read, two fundamentally, I think, they're, they're, they're perhaps complementary, but different perspectives. Uh, the one perspective is that since the world is, of separation is fundamentally illusory, the only thing that's important is to get out of the hell that's the world. And so one can direct his or her spirituality primarily towards escaping the problems of the world, the pro personal problems and the suffering that's in the world. It's kind of similar to what Buddhism is understood to say. It was sometimes called an escapist spirituality, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I think though, there is another way of reading the course. When you look at it more carefully, it says, that yes, it's important to waken from the illusion, to waken to the kingdom of heaven, okay? But to do that, what is necessary is to look at the concrete illusions of people's suffering, whether it's physical, physical illness, social deprivation, the war in currently in Ukraine or Yemen or you know, all the places in the world that we don't hear about on the news because, well, I won't go into why the newscast focuses only on the Ukrainian white people uh, who are, I mean, it's a horrible thing, no question. Uh, but it, the course points out that it is extremely important to heal the concrete instances of suffering, of lack, by learning how to give a miracle which transforms it. Okay, I think that's why it's called a course in miracles, uh, and I'll. I, I discerned, well, actually, uh, one thing has come to mind as I was thinking, gathering my thoughts together about this, was that uh, I think it's a, a, an interesting phenomenon that happened last year when Marianne Williamson, who is one of the best known students of the course, submits her candidacy for presidency of the United States. Uh, a lot of people call it, you know, 
kooky things like that. That's how some of the the the, the media dismissed it. She, I I don't want to judge that, but I think what was important was that she laid out. If you, I, I took a look at her platform, which is remarkable, <laughs> and it's a platform of social justice. I mean, that if you look at the details one after the other, it is what Mike was just talking about, you know, economic justice, uh, educational justice, uh, the civil justice, uh, you know, fairness in the courts. It's well known that we have in our present system two systems of judge of justice, one for the rich and one for the poor. I mean, constant debate on that. Uh, so I think the course uh, has needs to be read. And I, 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 I like Mike, I, I wasn't dedicated to like you were for years. I saw your, what is it, professor of social justice? What was the title that you got uh, there? Peace and social justice studies. Peace and so yeah, I did teach a course back in 92. It was, it was an experimental course called the philosophy of peace where we address these issues, okay? And it was, I didn't see it as different from what I was doing in the course. As a matter of fact, I saw that, that my engagement as a teacher addressing the questions of how do we bring justice in the midst of the war in Iraq, uh, that was the first war in Iraq, <laughs> Uh, was 92 or 94, what was it? When, when did we have the first <laughs> invasion? And uh, anyway, so I think the course has, it, it can illuminate that question, but I think what, what I found was an interesting statement at the end of chapter 25. It's the very last statement in chapter 25. And it goes, I'll just read it right here. Uh, where is it here? What is God's belongs to everyone and is his due. Matter of fact, that's a, it doesn't call it a def, but I think it's a marvelous definition of what social justice is. Everybody must get his due or her due. Uh, and what is his, her, her due is everything. Okay. <laughs> I mean, in the course's view, it's the kingdom of heaven. You know, it's the restoration of our separated minds to the original state. And of course, the question then comes, okay, do, do we reach that state of complete justice the realization of God's justice as described here, do we realize it in one, you know, magically by reforming the government, reforming the laws, reforming the, the system, or do we move step by step, miracle by miracle to, the real, to that realization? I, and I, I think my, in my own experience is, as a student of the course, I've been working on this for 40 years, I what it goes now. I've been studying it and rereading it and going over again and practicing it. Uh, and I'm by no means there. I mean, I, I've had glimpses of what I think justice is but there is also my own ego that keeps on going up. Ask my wife, she'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Wives are good for and, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they remind you, you know, I, I kind of live in the clouds in the, in the right. ideal world, but uh, it, it's, it's good to be reminded, yes, ideas have a place, but also, you know, the concrete world of, moment to moment existence in relationship, that's where it's at. So that's, that's basically my overall view on that. One of the questions that I think seems really relevant is, is how the course transforms us uh, so that we are more responsible citizens of the world, but, but 
Also, in terms of going back to my first second, I'll address this, that how do I, well, of course, it's explaining it, but we need to discover the Christ with inside our, in, our, in ourselves. You know, as we awaken to the fact that you are the Christ, I'm the Christ, Ted's the Christ, you know, everybody here is the Christ. And, and but then I live that out loud. I mean, I mean, by out loud, I mean, just in terms of loving the world. And, and how does that change things? Just because I change, right, Mike? Well, I think, yes. Go I, ahead, I, I, either one of you. <laughs> yeah, I just I, I, one of the things that's come in the recent war in Ukraine. It, it's on the news. All I just looked at at right. Fareed Zakaria, and we're reminded again every day. We're reminded again and again of the atrocities yeah. and so on. And uh, one of the things that uh, I find extremely challenging is to look at the image of Putin, who's painted as mm. a diabolical being, you know, sure. and I mean, obviously he is, but how do I see the Christ yes. in Putin? Right. That's, that's the real challenge. I mean, that's a good question. Yeah. If you can't see the Christ in boot Putin or in Trump or in whoever, whoever you consider to be <clears throat> the problem maker, Right, you're still not at the point where you're capable of giving the miracle that needs to happen. Matter of fact, I I've concluded that basically, what it means to give a miracle is to see the Christ as in present in Putin, in Putin right. and everybody. I mean, bo both sides. I mean, right. whether it's Zelensky, it's easy to see it in Zelensky or the people who are suffering, but can I see it in all the, the, the nasty guys, you know, the right. bad guys? Mike, you want to reflect on that? Well, uh, listening to Ted, my reflection uh, is that I think it's also significant that Marianne Williamson ran for president and her program is very much a social justice program, as you said, and it's articulated extremely well in her book, uh, I think, Saving the Soul of America, I think. I think that's the title. Mm -hmm. uh, it is liberation theology in a way. I met Mary Ann Williamson a couple of years ago. My wife, who is the director of women's studies at Berea College, had invited Mary Ann Williamson to uh, the college. And we ended up driving her back from Berea to Cincinnati, a drive of a couple of hours and had other conversations with her. And we got talking about our approach to A Course in Miracles. And she asked me about my background. I told her, and I mentioned liberation theology. She said, what's that? Mm -hmm. I told her liberation theology is reflection on the following of Christ from the point of view of the poor and the oppressed who are committed to changing their situation. She said, oh, that's interesting. We talked about that on our way to Cincinnati. And as she got out of the car, she said, you know what? Maybe I'm really interested in writing a book, a writing, doing something on Jesus in relation to A Course in Miracles. Maybe we should, together, do a downloadable podcast on the topic. Well, then, she, of course, she got involved in the presidency and all that. And she uh, had no time for that, I'm sure. But she is making that link between A Course in Miracles and the historical Jesus. And when you do that, you say, okay, where is that Jesus to be found? I go back to my mantra. If Jesus is the Christ, the Christ is also Jesus. Who was Jesus? The son of an unwed teenage mother. <laughs> belonged to the working class. He was an outcast from his religious community. They thought he, they said he had a devil. He was the friend of prostitutes and drunkards. That was the accusation. He was deemed by the Roman Empire as a terrorist and a revolutionary. And for that reason, he ended up his life a victim of torture and capital punishment. 
So if we want to know where Jesus is or where the Christ is or what is the content of the Christ, we have to say, oh, he's not where I've been looking. He's not in my group. He's in that group. The one is not at the top of the ladder, but at the bottom of the ladder. Okay, then where does that leave me? That leaves you according, or leaves me, according to the injunctions of A Course in Miracles, having to stop doing what we're doing vis-a-vis -vis the people at the bottom of the ladder. And what is it that we're doing? We're attacking them. We attack them all over the world. We attack them in Yemen, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Ethiopia, in Libya, in Syria, in Cuba, in Venezuela. We attack them because we think they're attacking us or we are somehow made to believe that they are attacking us. And the Course in Miracles says, no, no, no. It centralizes attack and non-attack. It says, no one's attacking you. You are the attacker. Stop doing it. Right. That's the social justice message of A Course in Miracles. Right. Very often when I'm, sometimes I'm, even, I'm doing a talk and I say, well, kind of summarize things at the end. I'll say, number one, just do not attack. If you really understand, do not attack. You know, because that's coming from your insane mind, which thinks that there's a problem out there and that somehow or another it needs to be fixed rather than recognizing that what needs to be fixed is this mind, the mind. <laughs> in terms of the way I see the world. Why can't I just love the world instead of thinking that it, I've got to fix the problem out there? But the projection makes perception. And that course is so Could clearly saying, right? Could I add one other thing? Sure. And this gets us to the content of Course in Miracles again. If you read the, uh, the course, it keeps talking about prison and being in prison. It does, yeah. And that reminds me of what the Course is really saying in terms of Plato's Republic. Hmm. And his, the central image, a central image in the Republic, namely the parable of the cave or sure. the allegory of the cave. Sure. And it coincides very well with A Course in Miracles describing yeah. the condition of people in the belly of the imperial beast. Because Plato was describing Athens also an imperial beast. Uh -huh. And he was saying that the condition is like people sitting in front of a cave wall with a fire behind them that casts shadows on the wall. And those people think that life is unfolding before them and looking at their shadows, they think they are looking at themselves. They are not. A person escapes from the cave, discovers the world as God created it and returns yeah. to liberate. Okay, you know the story. But that is what A Course in Miracles is calling us to do, to escape from, again, what Bell Hooks calls the white supremacist, imperialist, capitalist patriarchy to the way the world came from God's hands. The world that, as Ted was saying, belongs to everybody. I often say to students that uh, the world's not a prison. It is a prison, but it, it's a reformatory. I mean, this is what reformatory really meant, you know, here to help us to reform <laughs> the way we see so that we can see the way Jesus saw. Right. Well, related to that, I think th there were, in reading over, I, I, I think the most relevant, at least to this issue, the most relevant chapter of the course is chapter 25. It's called The Justice of God. And I've been I've reread re that three times in the last week. It it is so chock full of insights. It's like oh, I, I have to take my breath, read a paragraph, and take my breath and say, "Oh, <laughs> what does that say?" And cool. then come back again and again and again. But in in going over that, what I found, and this may be an oversimplification or maybe it's, it's too complex, uh, or what seemed to me like seven, it's a nice number, seven principles that are articulated in that chapter. And I, I would, I'll just read them to you as 
okay. they come out. You could go back to that chapter. Anybody else here can look at it closely and perhaps flesh it out yourself. But the first one, and, and these are just lines from different uh, paragraphs there. Sure. One, you see what you believe is there. All right. That means the war in Ukraine, whatever, all social justice, uh, injustice. Second point, forgiveness is one's only meaningful function. Right. One's only meaningful function. Right. Third, the Holy Spirit uses what you give to him for your salvation, which is for all. Mm -hmm. The fourth principle, your special function is to call to him so his understanding is yours. He sees it as a whole. He sees it healed. The fifth one, to give a miracle is justice. Hmm. Six, the miracle you receive, this is one that really is a mind bender, the miracle you receive, you give. And the seventh one, it, it's not from there, but it, it, I've kind of digested it together. Justice comes to and grows in the world to the extent the miracle is received and given. So those are seven principles, which I, I mean, you could, you could develop that into a whole commentary on that. And I think it's a, each of those points would offer a, a kind of meditational thing. And I, and I think they are already in the workbook. Those principles, if you look at the, some of the later, the later, uh, 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 lessons of the workbook, they are right there. They're, 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 <laughs> there are practices to help you develop, help the student develop those insights, not into just intellectual formulas, but into lived experience where the transformation can come. All right. Thank you. Believe it or not, time flies when I do this. It says to me it does. It's five minutes to one. Uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break now. The hush of heaven holds my heart today. The hush of heaven holds my heart today. All right, we're back, and um, Bud's going to summarize what's going on in the, the chat for us. I'd also like to encourage uh, Mark Rye, if he's with us, and or Sam Menahan, if they're with us, a couple of their agamenditions to, uh, to throw their whatever they like to throw in <laughs> here. Let's start with Bud. There's been a lot of really interesting commentary and observation in the chat. Not a lot of questions, mostly just insights. And, and I love that. I love all the insights. Yeah. A number of people have commented on how one gravitates to the course. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those who are Catholic, they, they observe that there's a lot of Catholics. For if you're a Jew, you see a lot of Jews. <laughs> and as a longtime course teacher, I've seen people of all belief systems and no belief systems that all gravitate to the course. And I, th I think that, that Leslie pointed out something that was very powerful. It's really that notion of the mystical component that mm. helps us to rise above the battleground and actually see where all these belief systems connect. And, and the Course does a beautiful job, although it's clearly in the language of Christianity, it still does a beautiful job of rising above all these different belief systems and tying them together at this mystical level. 
and 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 Davi talked about that as well. So I just wanted to reflect on that for a moment. And and here's a couple of questions. Um, so Ted and Mike, how have you experienced A Course in Miracles as an internal interactive experience with your whole self? That is the the Holy Spirit and Jesus who learned to identify completely with that voice, the voice of the Holy Spirit, and is now teaching us directly from within it through ACIM. So what's been your experience of, of that internalization of that inner voice? Hey, either one of you guys think to start with that? Mike, you're nodding your head like you, why don't you start us? Well, my internalization, the way I'd respond to that probably differs from many people here is I experienced a course in miracles the way I read it from the belly of the beast and in Plato's cave is a call to miracle in the sense of changing my mind, uh -huh. raising my consciousness and raising my consciousness causes me and changing my mind causes me to be dissatisfied with what I know from our culture's propaganda and education about the world. It calls me to learn something about economics, mm -hmm. something about history, mm -hmm. something about history other than the standard official story. Those are spiritual tasks as I understand them and they impact my interior life. I think of almost nothing else. I pray of al about almost nothing else. In fact, and this will scandalize many, I've said this recently to my son who works for the State Department. My reflection on the following of Christ has called me to change my mind about the country in which I live and to see it in the words of the Sandinista and Nicaragua anthem as the enemy of humankind. Whoa. And it causes me then to, in my interior life, and I, this is what scandalized my son, again, works in the State Department for <laughs> Victoria Newland, causes me, I said, to pray for the last 25 years for the downfall of the United States. Whoa. And if that, of course, scandalized him, it probably scandalizes everybody here. Yeah. But that is the spirituality that as someone trying to identify with the world's poor and the oppressed, who are trying to live under the heel of the jackboot of the United States, it causes me to make that prayer repeatedly. Does it require that or is it simply a matter of helping us to engage in a change of mind? The course is about changing our mind, the way we see. That is a huge change in my, in my mind. Well, yeah. That's yeah. a huge change. And it, in, a, in a person, and I'll end here and give Ted a chance, mm -hmm. but in a person who growing up educated for the priesthood, extreme, the most conservative institution probably in the world. Right. And being a leader, trying to be a leader within that and be as being as a result, a Republican who cast his first vote for Barry Goldwater. <laughs> <laughs> but then traveling all over the world at the lowest level possible, in revolutionary situations in Cuba, I've repeatedly wow. have been in Cuba, in Nicaragua, in Brazil, throughout the third world, changed my mind. That's a spiritual change. Mm -hmm. yeah, that would do it. Ted? So the question is, how does the course help me come to the realization of the Christ in me? Uh, I mean, that, that, that question is extremely important because I think uh, 
it, it actually is the foundation of what I read off as those seven principles mm. of social justice. Uh, the, what comes to mind is another chapter in the course, which is called The New Beginning and mm. the Rules for Decision. A rule, you know, rules for a decision. Right. And I've contemplated that and I practice that every day. I practice that eight times, 10 times a day, as a matter of fact. Uh, I wake up in the morning, uh, think of the kind of day that I want, and then qualify that with the, with the formula, with the, the statement. Uh, if I make no decisions by myself, hmm. this is the kind of day that I will have that will be given me. Hmm. It doesn't always happen that way because I usually start making decisions within by myself within about three minutes. <laughs> uh, but yeah. it is it, 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 that chapter is. I think, I mean, what I found personally, it is, it, it summarizes the whole workbook. If you can, if you can practice that, you know, the rules for decision, you've got it. <laughs> and I'm still working on it. Okay. Uh, and what, what the essence of that practice is that <clears throat> if I make a judgment my, my ego judgment, uh, and it can be about, you know, I can turn on the TV and look at Tucker Carlson, you know, the broadcast of Tucker Carlson or Trump, and my spontaneous reaction is, and this is according to my conditioning, is to condemn him. You know, he's, 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 he's a diabolical being or something like that, you know. <laughs> Uh, maybe not diabolical, but he's he's a uh, he's an evil being. Okay, a rebel uh, rouser. And what I yeah what what yeah th th what I what happens is okay if I catch myself in making that judgment, and then ask okay, I screwed up. I'm 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 really pissed off when I see his face. It makes me very, very unhappy. I, I'm angry at this guy and I've lost my peace. I mean, it, and the course is perfectly right. As soon as you make your own personal judgment, you, your own ego judgment, call it, then that pulls you out of listening to the Holy Spirit. And of course, that's, you know, that's my karma. I guess I just have to, you know, I ask myself, how many lifetimes have I done this <laughs> again and again and again and again and again? And now uh, I'm born into this particular circumstance as this individual, and I'm given another opportunity to learn the lesson. Hopefully, <laughs> I'll learn it, okay, <laughs> within this life. And if I don't, uh, it, it's simply because I. It, it's a slow process, okay? Uh, I'm a slow learner. Okay, so that's that's how I uh, uh, practice this or try to practice it and uh, come into congruence. I mean, to me, uh, early in the study of the course, uh, the whole essence of the course in one way is to learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit. Krishnamurti calls it listen to intelligence. There are other names in, in the Buddhism that calls listening to the Buddha mind. I mean, it's different names, uh, listening to Krishna, listening to all these, you know, different names. The names aren't important. Listening to the Christ that's in me. Uh, and not only in me. I mean, one thing I've really learned is uh, I tend to be meditate, I, I have a practice of meditation every day, and you kind of t turn, uh, you, you, you begin to think of it as a solo project, you know, uh, but what has been coming clearer to me 
my wife tells me, you don't listen to me. I don't know if any, any, any husband has heard that said by their wife. <laughs> but <laughs> it, took me, it <laughs> took me a long time. I took it personally as an insult. I said, I listen to you. <laughs> but what she is saying is I, I'm, I'm realizing you are not listening to my deepest being. Uh, you're, mm. you're shutting me out. And maybe I'm thinking also, maybe I have to listen to Putin. Maybe mm. I have to listen to Trump. Maybe I have to listen to Tucker Carlson, not to ex accept what he's they're saying, but hear the Christ calling, you know, mm. the, there's that there's beautiful, I mean, the most beautiful line in the whole course, I think, is everything is either love or a call for love. And if you can regard every perception as that, I mean, if I can come to that, I'm still working on it. <laughs> but sure. I think if I can come to that, then, then the dream uh, the, the unhappy dream will transform into the happy dream. Huh. I'm just hoping that that will happen. All right. Bud, you got any other, uh, some more observations? You're, you're muted, Bud. Observations or questions? Because well, we do have one more. We have a, what, whatever, whatever. Yeah, we have another question. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, yeah. All right. So here's, it's a, it's a long statement, but I think we can get through it. Um, what I don't understand about the Course's definition of justice, as in Chapter 25, is that it counts on person-to-person -person miracle and love giving, which I agree is essential, but I cannot understand why it says nothing about corrupt and unjust systems and structures that oppress the poor, etc. Why does it completely leave the second part out without a concerted progressive socialist system based on human rights, as in the UN? How will we ever get there? If you'd like to pick that up, either one of you guys. Well, can I kind of second that as my contribution and my response to that? I would second that and uh, say that as a lover of A Course in Miracles, I would have to say that one of my great fears and about it, and I see it in uh, students of A Course in Miracles that I'm familiar with and have a discussion with them pretty regularly about what to do concerning the problems of the world, especially the problems that are experienced by poor oppressed people by the capitalist imperialist, Decide. white supremacist patriarchy. What to do about that? And the response that I find from most aficionados of A Course in Miracles is you take care of your own garden. That's right. your contribution. Right. By changing yourself, it's the most you can do. You cannot do anything about that other thing. Who are you? You're just a, a person trying to live it a good life hmm. and the best thing you can do to affect them is to change yourself and i see the truth of that and i ted too i would never give up my practice of meditation my daily practice of meditation for anything it is the most important anchor in my life hmm. but at the same time i feel i must be doing something beyond that Right. Something that more directly addresses the problems that the questioner or the person making that statement was referencing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know exactly what to do about it. What I'm trying to do now, and what I've done in my life is teach, teach this kind of stuff, teach liberation theology. And now that I've retired, I write about it. I'm doing what I couldn't do when I was teaching. I didn't have enough time to write so extensively, but I keep thinking, yeah, but is that enough? I'm sitting at my desk. <laughs> Meanwhile, we're dropping bombs on the people in Yemen, have killed 400,000 of them, have created a famine there, and nobody talks about it. We talk about Ukraine, where a few thousand people have lamentably been killed. We have killed 400,000. 
and are doing it as we speak. And our politicians are posturing as though they're rending their garments about, oh, poor people in Ukraine. Yes, poor people in Ukraine. But we are doing worse and have done worse in Iraq, in Afghanistan, Somalia, that whole list, Syria, the whole list that I made before. Yeah. That bothers me as I'm sitting comfortably at my desk and I don't know what to do about it. Ted, you want to address that? Yeah. When I was, another thing that was hitting me, it hit me last night as I was preparing my thoughts for this. It, it kind of ties into what you're saying because I, have, I haven't been as involved as Mike. I haven't gone to South America, Central America, Cuba, and so on. Uh, that wasn't my karma. I mean, that my interest was more uh, into the nature of consciousness. I did travel around the world in 1976 and seven, went to India and met lots of holy people and so on. Uh, so I, and, and yet I, I've all, I've all, I've all along, I guess one of the, on that trip, um, I ended up, one of the last places I visited was Hiroshima. And that was a transforming experience. I mean, just looking, there, there, there's a Buddhist stupa on a hill outside the, the town. It overlooks the whole city. And you look down and now it's all rebuilt. The only thing that's there is the, what they call it the atomium. It's the one building that they left standing as a monument in, in International Peace Park, I think it's called. And uh, I was so deeply moved uh, at that point that I said, I, I made a promise, I made a vow that I would dedicate my life to peace, to find peace, okay? Uh, and one of the things that strikes me in the Course's teaching uh, is what do you do? What do you do as an individual person a part of this whole beast structure, you know, I, I, I share your feeling, you know, I, I maybe is not as harsh on the, I, I, I'm more compassionate. I mean, I, I, I think United States evolved. I mean, we've come a long way since slavery, you know, since uh, 1776. Okay. And there's still a lot of work, you know, the, the pyramid on that symbolized on the dollar bill with the eye atop it, that pyramid is not completed yet. I think it's a beautiful symbol mm. of the project that America is, which in a sense is, I think, uh, uh, makes the United States like a beacon on the planet of possibilities, you know, uh, although it constantly is needing to re restructure those possibilities. But one expression and, and that came to me last night is you need do nothing mm -hmm. to do anything involves the body mm -hmm. and if you engage in doing you affirm that the body is what is important mm -hmm. And that, that it goes against my conditioning. I mean, I am an embodied, separated mind, you know. And when I, you know, I, I feel pain, you know, physical pain, that's, that's a true reality for me, you know. I mean, it, it's more real than any idea that I might, uh, at least when I hit my finger with a hammer, you know. That's, that's much more real than anything in the course when it happens, okay. I haven't come to, I'm, <clears throat> I can't imagine Jesus, you know, being crucified with nails in his hands and his feet. <laughs> and I, I wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> and I'm relieved when the Course says, you are not asked to be crucified. You don't have to follow me in that, you know. I mean, Francis of Assisi did it. There were other individuals that went through, you know, the experiences of suffering, you know, intense physical suffering. 
Uh, but the Course says, no, that's not necessary. That, that, that's not a, that's not, it meant of, it's besides the point. Right. What I get is, so here, here, to put this su summarized, if I need do nothing, then what is left for me, the best contribution, the highest contribution that I can make to the social injustice that I see, I mean, it's witness, you know, it, this evidence is given again and again and again, uh, just turn on the tube, uh, turn on your, you know, All be right. aware of what's going on, read the newspapers, give a miracle learn how to give a miracle. And the other thing is, uh, I'm thinking of how we, what, what are we doing as a, a, a country right now in response to the invasion of, of Ukraine? We're calling to do something, okay? to fight back, send weapons. I mean, that's been the biggest, I mean, it's two things. One, like you're doing, John, is sending the contributions to people to relieve them, you know, of the, you know, the displaced persons, you know, they're, they need medicine and so on. But the big thing that we're giving is more guns to fight and it's just getting worse. I mean, the prediction that I saw this morning is that they've got a new general in charge. He's the one that did that was in charge in Syria, and it's going to get worse. That's what the prediction is, mm -hmm. because he was a merciless killer, killed even more civilians than was out. So what I'm saying is, uh, and, and there's another passage in the course, power cannot oppose. Mm -hmm. Power mm -hmm. cannot oppose. Good line. For opposition would weaken it, and weakened power is a contradiction in ideas. And that's that's where I, you know, I've tend to be an activist. You know, I've gone into many demonstrations. You know, held up uh, signs and so on, uh, and called for getting rid of Bush, getting rid of <laughs> whoever it was. But I wonder if what the Course is saying is a, it's a more difficult one. I mean, Jesus did not oppose. The nails went in, he did not oppose, okay? Right. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just throwing that out as maybe a calling for a much deeper, much deeper deeper penetration into what the course is teaching is and generally how do we bring about i mean here see i, I even asked the question how <laughs> how do you do it <laughs> and right. so I'm back i'm in, in 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 a kind of cycle of doing 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 as the as the solution to the problem i'm right. reminded of uh what was a, a talk given by alan watts and he makes the observation in the in, in the East, the, the, the adage is, if you don't know what to do, do nothing. In the West, if you don't know what to do, do something. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is, okay. Right. So I, I think we really need to understand, you know, what, what in Hinduism is called karma yoga. That is, what it, does it mean to do? And that doing with disinterested, just engage in what the Holy Spirit tells you to do, what intelligence tells you to do, if that's what it says, you know, if it's giving or, you know, if it may be join up and go sign up to, to go to war and work with the, with, the, with the Ukrainians to defend themselves, I can't judge. All I can know is what is what the Holy Spirit or intelligence tells me is the appropriate action to engage in, and then to engage in it simply because it is to be done insofar as that action is called for, but don't look for results. Right. Anyway, so that's how I look at it.
I'll just address that just a little bit. I, I really agree with what Mike was saying. The Course in Miracles is really written for the individual. I mean, it's written to you about how you need to change your mind in order to see better so that you can have the perspective of Christ and then act from that point. You, you talk, Mike, about uh, attending your own garden. Well, yes, I agree that 100%. But at the same time I tend my own garden, I might be able to do that in such a way that I will create an abundance, uh, which will maybe share the beauty of this garden and the produce from this garden and such that that it's not just for me, it's not for me alone. You know, and our the course is really asking us to share our love in a big way. And I see a lot of a little bit of what's going on in the chat myself is uh, that kind of dialogue that's going on for us. Bud, do you have anything else, or shall we go to that? I see we've got a couple of hands. Can I just make a comment here that just occurs to me and has yeah. occurred to me that, you know, somebody said, and I hope this, Bud, uh, be careful, it might be something here to edit, but uh, somebody, people love A Course in Miracles spirituality. The powers that be love that kind of spirituality because it doesn't do anything. I'm do anything to change the situation, the world situation in terms of social justice. Right. They hate people and crucify people and torture people who make the connection between spirituality and social activism. Right. Nobody's going to kill A Course in Miracles uh, student, <laughs> student or following the usual understanding of A Course in Miracles, but they do kill people who make the connection like King, like Medgar Evers, like uh, in other traditions, Gandhi, like Malcolm. Uh, they hate Dorothy Day. They hate the Berrigans and imprison them. They, and so the criteria for true Jesus-centered spirituality and be reminded that it is the voice of Jesus in A Course in Miracles that we have, Oh. The true criterion is here, bud, is somebody said, if you ain't pissing somebody off, you probably ain't doing, we'll say squat. <laughs> and of course, in miracles, people are not going to disturb anybody. And the situate and the powers that be love that. Hmm. Does that indicate that we might be on the wrong path in our tending our own gardens? rather than struggling to find within A Course in Miracles the voice of Jesus that reflects his intense ability to make people angry. He made the Jews angry. He was a Jew. He made people with his own, you know, his own faith community angry. He made the Roman Empire angry to such an extent that they killed him. Ted, you say we shouldn't crucify any, uh, we shouldn't uh, we don't have to be crucified. What A Course in Miracles and what the gospel, it seems, connected to A Course in Miracles tells us, nobody's crucifying you. You are cru crucifying other people. Stop it. That's the social justice message in A Course in Miracles. It does How equate anger to murder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, what do we make then of anger? What do we make of Jesus anger. What do we make of that? A core concept of the course is that this is an illusion and that we're here to get these lessons and we're going to get them in our own individual unique way. And whether that's reflecting on the war in some other location or the war in your backyard or the war in your house, it's mm -hmm. all you. It's just you. Mm -hmm. There's only one of us and it's just us. It's just me collectively looking at what is stopping me from recognizing love and making that choice for love. All right. So, yes, let's go to the people with their raised hand, John. All right, uh, Lynn. Mighty companions. Mwah. Thank you so much, Ted, Michael, John, everybody else. Um, yeah, I had wrote a poem um, last month, and I called it Putin. But now that I read it, it could be anybody, including myself. 
I'd like to read it if that's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Can I see your image as a child of God when no limit on cruelty taps at your heart? So deep must I go to know you in self, seeming ignorance of spirit that has touched all minds. The veil is strong. Your pain explodes. Parable of fire seems uncontained. So hard to bless this child of God as I gaze on what appears his form. Our light, our love, devoted past stories. In trust, I bless you. Pass the veil. Thank you, Lynn. Beautiful. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Tucker? Oh, wow. What a powerful, powerful yes. series of things. And I, I, I uh, uh, to Ted's thing about, you know, uh, my name is Tucker Clark, uh, very close to Tucker Carlson. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, every, every time I see him, I puke, you know, uh, uh -oh. and, 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 and I, I, uh, he, he, he has an elitist background like me. He was the Swanson heir, you know, and so he went to a little prep school. And anyhow, uh, the, 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 the thing is that our, our propens my propensity to be part, uh, and John has helped me out with this a lot, is that I always feel like uh, I'm, I'm, I'm right about everything. I was an anti-war, you know, I went to the Peace Corps, I did uh, Save the Children in Ethiopia, I did all this stuff that, you know, was, I was being right about, you know, and um, so I get very cranked out about making people wrong everywhere, whether it's interpersonally or governmentally, politically, re Republicans, Trump, or what, whatever else. And so what I'm asking Mike in particular, because liberation tech, uh, uh, theology, my father was an Episcopal minister uh, uh, at, who was drawn very much to Martin Luther King Jr. and he marched on Selma and did all this stuff that, that, that that it, it, it still is making the opposition totally wrong. And in the course of uh, uh, miracles, it, it, uh, as Ted was pointing out, you know, uh, it, 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 in some ways it's almost selfish to, to just say, okay, cultivate your own garden, you know, do, do that. And, and um, uh, Michael, you made reference to uh, your uh, ride with Marion Williamson. If you notice now, she has a podcast that brings people on where she, uh, you know, points out everything about Afghanistan, about uh, the, the guy that was in prison, about Chevron. And, and, and she is really cultivating the, the, the not making people wrong, but how we can elevate the conversation so that, so that things can, can uh, you know, evolve to, to this new human that we're all trying to be now that to save the planet to uh, deal with covid to um, uh, you know change voter laws to the, the, i mean all, all along the way and i just I'm, I'm asking you this is my final question <laughs> is, is is it is it what can you do with this propensity to make everything wrong i know that when krishna in 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 the uh, uh, bhagavad gita uh, he, he solved the problem with the Gurkhas actually solved, which is you just go in and you take a huge stand on whatever you have in your heart um, uh, to, to do. And, and I, I think that sort of assists me a little bit, but I just find it very, very difficult when I have arguments with people. I'm in a nursing home here and a, a lot of people spout, spout QAnon crap and all this other stuff and uh, Republican uh, talking points. And I, I just, I just, uh, you know, it, it's like blaming the victim, which we used to call in social work uh, stuff. And I, I just, I just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm put, pointing out the question that you, I think some of you guys have uh, alluded to already that, that, the, that what can you do with whether it's, I mean, in liberation theology, it's making somebody wrong. The, the, the oppressing uh, stuff and all that other stuff. And whenever you set up a duality like that, 
where right and wrong is part of the equation, then we're a sort of away from uh, what the teachings of the course are. And I don't know how to get away, away from that. So thank good, you. Good question. Uh, Mike, you want to start and Ted? Well, gee, that's a really good question. And I hardly know where to enter. Uh, that's, that's a, there are so many things uh, said there that are just right on and important. I begin to answer by recalling what I tried to say at the beginning that A Course in Miracles is addressed to people who are in the belly of the beast. It's as if at the time of Jesus' life, a book were written uh, or he were able to address the people in Rome. He's telling, he's talking to them. He's talking to us who are Americans who are the oppressors. And he's saying, stop making people wrong. You are the ones who are making the people wrong in the global South. You are fighting wars against no one else, but people who are weak and oppressed in the global South. Stop blaming them. Stop making that dichotomy. Realize you are one with them. You are making the distinction that is we in, in the belly of the beast. We are making the distinction that separates people. We're saying they are not like us. Black people, brown people are not the same as white people who are privileged people. Please see Raul Peck's wonderful three-part documentary called Exterminate All the Brutes, B-R-U-T-E-S, All the Brutes. And he says that the history of the world can be summarized in three words. Civilization, that is white supremacy, European. Civilization, colonialism, extermination. You are the exterminators and you've done it. Stop it. Mm. You are wrong. You right. are wrong. You who are reading A Course in Miracles are wrong in attacking other people. Stop it. You are one with them. Change your mind. That's the miracle that the Course in Miracles is after changing right. the way we see the world, changing our perceptions. That's the power of the Course in Miracles. That's all it's about. Ted, you want a response to, to Carl? To Carl <laughs> Tucker? <laughs> Tucker Carlson. <laughs> I'll respond to Tucker Clark and Tucker Carlson. <laughs> Actually, I can't respond to Tucker Carlson because I, I don't listen to him. I, I put him on the... <laughs> Do not don't, listen, list. Don't get irritated by <laughs> my nonsense view, uh, box. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, I happen to be going through the, the workbook uh, for the fourth or fifth time. And it's a coincidence, and I think it's no coincidence, no. that today's practice is number lesson 352 which goes it, it 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 fits exactly with what we're saying right here justice excuse me judgment and love are opposites right. from one comes come all the sorrows of the world but from the other comes the peace of God himself. Right. Right. And, and I, I can tell you, you know, I, I've been trained in judgment. I, you know, I got my PhD in making good judgments. That, that, that's, that's, that's the professional hazard of being an accomplished academician. That's because the criterion of making it to the top of that ladder, that academic ladder, is to make good, reliable judgments. And we praise judgments in academia. But the course is saying, if you make judgments, you bring all the sorrows of the world. 
that's a poo <laughs> in a way that's annihilating the whole academic hierarchy because if so the question is and, and i think it goes much deeper i mean if you ask okay why is judgment i mean maybe it need we need to explore why is judgment and i've i've contemplated this again and again i've looked at every statement in the course about judgment and what it means if you go to the original german uh the german translation is actually much better uh, the german word is called urteil it means ultimate division thailand or thailand ultimately to to ultimately separate the whole separation began as an act of judgment that's the way the course puts it by the son on some level of his mind to pr to produce all this which is an illusion the course is very explicit. I mean, different from what Mary Perrin says, you know, physical world is a reality. And I can understand, yes, we cling to the reality of your computer, my body and all that. But if the course is accurate, all of this is nothing but the shadows of the wall of the cave or forms within the matrix. That's a that matrix is another beautiful <laughs> rendition interpretation of the uh, of, 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 of what Plato was talking about. Uh, and so the question is, if I judge somebody as being, and, and I, I'm 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 just throwing this out, not not to disagree with my, but but I because I there's a part of me that totally agrees with you, Mike. <laughs> you know, we got to fight, we got to fight the damn capitalists, <laughs> you know, because they're causing the whole problem. You know, the billion, it's the billionaires in Russia and it's the billionaires in the United States. If I want to make a, if I'm a make a job that are, that have fueled all the wars probably since Babylon, you know, <laughs> you know, the, the super rich, you know, the, 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 the privileged. Okay. So, but if I, put myself in that judgmental state, what I'm doing is dividing them from me. I have to see, I am the capitalist. Mm -hmm. I am the poor. I am Mother Teresa. I am Jesus. I am Hitler. I am all, I am Putin. I am all these things. If I can now, that, that, that's, I, I feel a compulsion to try to come to that realization mm. because, I mean, when, when the, the, what does the Holy Spirit see? I mean, what the Course says, the mm. Holy Spirit says, I see, I am you, 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 you. Well, I don't even know he has an eye to say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he perceives we are all one. We are all the Christ mind, good and bad alike. And these judgments that we make to label one is bad, one is capitalist, one is the other, those seem to be uh, problems that if we engage in that, we, 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 bring, we, we participate in bringing the problems to the world, the sorrows to the world. You know, Ted, that's, that's true. At the same time, that's true. There's this, this line in The Course of Miracles which says, we take scissors and knives away from children. You know, right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, we don't. We don't because they can hurt themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. So something is that that's saying we do this. At the same time, you love that child, and mm -hmm. you do that because you love the child. Mm -hmm. Right, and you don't want them to hurt themselves because they would hurt themselves if we didn't do that. Mm -hmm. I'm just seems to be a lot out. of people running with scissors. <laughs> huh? There seems to be a lot of people running with scissors. <laughs> right. So I'm just uh, this just but well just, I get maybe my question to you, John, is this. Okay, what do you do with that statement? Judgment is that from which if you participate in judging anybody, anything, any time, any place, 
you are contributing to the sorrows of the world. I understand that. And then part of that sorrow is the sorrow that's in my own mind because I see that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's getting a, a therefore we, we do need to get above the battlefield. You know, we need to get above, doesn't mean you don't do anything about what's going on in the battle, but you get from a perspective. I mean, if, if this is an illusion and if we're just witnessing this, that's also very helpful for us to be able to see that. Otherwise, we're wallowing in it mm -hmm. ourselves. And if we're wallowing in it, that's not really helping anything at all, including our own minds. Which mm -hmm. remain projective. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. a question for people who are better schooled in A Course in Miracles than I am. I'm a student of the Course in Miracles, of A Course in Miracles. But the way I read the use of the word illusion in A Course in Miracles doesn't mean that things don't exist. This shirt doesn't exist. It means simply this it is not lasting. It is not ultimately that, that, important. That's exactly what it's body said. is not ultimately important, but right. it's real. And Ted, like you, I feel that pain if I hit my finger with a hammer. Yeah. But all that it means, it doesn't mean that it's unreal in the sense that it doesn't exist. It simply is not what's ultimately important. It's not eternal. Not eternal. Yeah, it has in space time. I, I'm, I don't want to deny the reality of what's in front of me in space time. Yeah. It's, this is not eternity. This is not heaven. But do you think that too often students of A Course in Miracles interpret that as, oh, it doesn't exist, it doesn't oh, matter? Oh, that's quite it possible. Yes, of course, that's very possible. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Were there any other... I, Russ was on before with his hand up. I don't see him now, but <clears throat> there may be anybody else want to ask questions. Uh, Alice or L Leslie. Hi, Leslie. Go ahead. Uh, John, thank you, gentlemen. Um, that was uh, very thought provoking, to put it mildly. Um, Professor Rivaj Sol, my only comment to you is you sound more like a Jesuit than a Col Columbine priest. <laughs> um, I, I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking to myself, my God, he sounds like Mario Bergoglio uh, <laughs> after he had his uh, revelation, <laughs> after he was removed as. Uh, as the head of the Jesuits in Argentina, Mario Bergoglio, for those who don't know, is, uh, is uh, Pope Francis. Um, uh, I think, you know, I, I've really struggled. I've really struggled with this seeming dichotomy. And, you know, I'm by no means, I'm as learned in the course as uh, so many people uh, listening. I'm, I'm, literally a, I'm literally a baby. Um, but to me, what I what I found, particularly in my, you know, just in going through the uh, lessons, is take the principles, apply them, be still, and listen. And you know, the funny thing is, is that the wars that we talk about on a global basis are equally, for me, are equally present first in my own mind and then, immediate, and then immediately in my own circumstances, whether, you know, within my immediate relationships or within my family of origin. And what I've come to, and, you know, even within the city in which I live. So I take it as, and I won't say that one is more important than the other, but I think what I, what I try to use is, okay, this is where we're at. I'm going to extend this outward, almost like the rippling of a wave. And that I apply it immediately to my own relationships where I look at my own judgments and then try to listen and learn and help where I can help where I can try to extend it to my own community and then and help where I can and then it, and then try to extend it outward um, which is very different than what I used to do previously whereas I would try to deal with stuff that was far away but I wouldn't deal with the stuff that was you know immediately very close to me and in my face which I found is actually very challenging so I think you know my my question to both of you is what are your what are your thoughts about that and how do you look at things as far as 
just dealing with the judgment in our own minds and then, you know, extending that, extending that outward, you know, and sort of like a wave, like a ripple. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Mike, you want to start? Well, uh, Leslie, it, there's just no question that what you're doing with a Course in Miracles is wonderful and important and central to A Course in Miracles. The reason for my rather strong statements today is that we're talking about another dimension of The Course in Miracles. That is an important, important, important dimension that you're talking about. If we're not straightening out our own lives, uh, all the rest doesn't make a great deal of difference at all. It's very important to work on ourselves. But the topic at hand though, and that's the only reason I'm making these kind of provocative statements is that we're talking about something that is often overlooked by students of A Course in Miracles. That is the connection between A Course in Miracles and what I described as social justice at the beginning. That is a dimension of A Course in Miracles that I think is neglected, but it is not to deny the importance of the dimension you're referring to, that we have to work on every single day, everybody in this, on this call, everybody who is a student of A Course in Miracles, everybody who's trying to be a better person. Please understand me that I'm not dismissing, I, I'm not dismissing at all what you're saying. I think it's, I think it's extremely important. But there's elements of social justice that are in addition to what's happening in the wider world. There's an awful lot of them that are very close to home. And in my case, they exist even that exist to a significant degree within my own family. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, I think what you're saying there, that, that last point that you made there, uh, it, it's kind of hit me that I can understand that there is a war in Ukraine only because I see there's a war within my, a conflict within my own immediate world between me and my wife, my family. I mean, it's not, not uh, one is much more dramatic <laughs> and intense and violent and so on, but there, Actually, I don't even have to go to my family. I just go to myself. I see the war within myself, okay? <clears throat> and if I can't bring that battle within in myself to peace, what I'm going to be doing in my action with regard to the world is simply sending out that ripple of negativity of battle into the world. Uh, it's sort of like there's, it seems to be what, what the Course is calling for is, okay, you are a center with one center among mil seven million or seven billion or a trillion trillion centers within the whole universe. You're just one center in which the battle is occurring, the war is occurring, <clears throat> and where, where peace needs to be brought into that particular center, this person, me, I am the world. Like Krishnamurti puts it, you are the world. You know, if the, if the war is in me, the war is in the world. If the war is in the world, the war is in me, okay? It's sort of like a mutual kind of thing. So the lesson that I need to learn far more than anything else is step back from <laughs> judging anybody. And I, 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 I find it very difficult to do this. I judge Putin. That's my, <laughs> my <laughs> response. I mean, I, I say... <laughs> SOB, you know, yeah. he's doing this terrible thing, but am I also, do, do I, can I understand what Putin's doing if I don't see it in myself? We hate in others what we hate in ourselves. Sure. So maybe, maybe that's, that's 
I think an important thing for me to keep in keep in mind in tying into what you just said. Yeah. We're nearing the end of our time. I mean, there's a wonderful section in the course by what we call the war against yourself. Yeah. You know, which is really saying that whatever we project, whatever we throw out there to the world, a very important principle, the most basic law there is in the universe of the law of cause and effect. Mm -hmm. Right. So this thing that I'm throwing out there, that's going to boomerang. Mm -hmm. And that's going to come back and hit me and square on. Which is also true of the love I give to the world. <laughs> You know, which is the nice part about this. So we just, that's a learning, of learning how, you know, talk about projection, making perception. You know, that's how I learn. What I really want to be doing is loving the heck out of this world, whatever that means, so that I get to be a lover, <laughs> you know. Can I, can I jump in, John? Sure. Uh, it, this is Tucker. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, 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 with, with, uh, with such a stimulating thing, I had a huge thought that just came to me. Um, um, I, I've been, uh, as John probably knows, I've been projecting a lot into the future, like uh, Nostradamus. And so I'm in the 29th century. And right now, because of social media and uh, all these other things, I don't know how, how, how many of you know the the uh, 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 the uh, this the the song that just got generated. It's number one on Spotify. Uh, uh, that that uh, they they uh, this Ukrainian guy, and I'm trying. God, I'm just trying to remember the name of the the group. Uh, that, uh, but but that's number one because what they do is it, it's uh, rise up, rise up, and and then I I got all these contribution letters from Save the Children and. Uh, Doctors Without Borders, and I can feel really good about my little $15 maybe going towards something. And there's so many people that are uh, doing, raising uh, medical supplies and doing all this other stuff. And finally, uh, 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 Neil Donald Walsh uh, uh, posted this thing about there's a there's a website that you can go on every morning to look, look towards uh, 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 doing something towards uh, 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 just being towards uh, somebody, you know, loving towards somebody, and it's called Unite the Light dot uh, Global, which I'm, I made that one wrong because you couldn't get on Global because it's a GoDaddy site that uh, you know has problems. Yeah. But anyhow, so it, it's it's just I, I just uh, saying that there are uh, because we're in the uh, era of social media and all these other things that there's so many things that we can do like this Zoom class that uh, you know. Um, are, are, are just so spectacular that are different from when actually when the course first came out. There the, 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 the are things that we can actually feel good, not as to as to bad, but, but just feel good about contributing to right. the Twitter thing. So I'm just saying that. Okay. Thanks, Tucker. Oh, did you have anything else or did we, we're, we're near the end of our time here, so. I, I think we're good. Oh, okay, good. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Ted. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to get involved in this dialogue and to keep it going and to keep it in our own minds and see thank how you, we John. each thank of you. us grow uh, through this and understand things. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We usually end with the Lord's Prayer from the, the course. And usually, is Bobby with us, Leslie? He is. All right. Well, then <laughs> she's the best. So, <laughs> well, thank you for asking me to share this beautiful prayer. We've certainly been talking about a lot of illusions today. And, um, and I'm so grateful that people were speaking from deep within their honesty about where they're at, because I'm learning that uh, that's what Jesus wants us to bring forward. That's what the divine wants us to bring forward so that we can choose again with the right yeah. teacher. So, Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you, in which there are no illusions, and where no Our holiness is yours. What can 
there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? The sleep of forgetfulness is only the unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation, for temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given and accept but this into the minds which you created and which you love. Amen. 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 Thank you, Bobby. We're going to gallery view so we can tell each other goodbye and you